It's election night across America. 50 states, millions of votes. Inflation's terrible, gas prices are up, everything's falling apart right now. For me, my right to bodily autonomy is on the line. Breaking news. CBS News rates the House as leaning Republican. The Senate, as you say, really is too close to call. Florida is where woke goes to die. Never expected that we were going to turn these red counties blue. So what happened? Definitely not a Republican wave, that's for darn sure. Good afternoon. It's a good day, I think, for democracy. Are you guys watching the fake news anymore? Turn around and tell them, we're not watching you guys anymore. We don't care what you say. Now, in simple terms, this is where we are. Republicans are on track to win back the lower house of Congress, the House of Representatives, the upper house, the Senate, while well, that's still in play. Overall, Democrats did well in state governor races, and it looks like turnout was high. In short, this didn't meet Republicans' expectations. And what's at stake here is what President Biden can and can't get done in the next two years, and where America's heading with a presidential election on the way. And that goes some of the way to explaining that both sides combined were forecast to spend 9.7 billion dollars. To put that in context, that's more than double the last midterms. The most expensive contest was Pennsylvania's Senate race, with over $373 million spent, according to one estimate. That's roughly $68 per voter. And if that's the cost, next, let's pick out some of the results that are particularly important, starting in Florida, where the Republican Ron DeSantis won re-election as governor. We have embraced freedom. We have maintained law and order. We have protected the rights of parents. We have respected our taxpayers. And we reject woke ideology. This mattered for a couple of reasons. DeSantis won by a landslide, which, if he wants to take on Donald Trump for the presidential nomination, could give him momentum. Second, throughout his campaign, he talked about the economy as did many Republicans. And exit polling suggests this was a decent calculation. High inflation was voters' number one issue. But crucially, it wasn't the only issue. Let's turn to Pennsylvania, because there, in a race for the Senate, Democrat John Fetterman was the victor. I'm proud of what we ran on. Protecting a woman's right to choose. <laughs> raising our minimum wage. Fighting the union way of life. Yeah. Health care is a fundamental human right. We heard John Fetterman talking about abortion rights there. And since back in June, when the Supreme Court removed the constitutional right to abortion, Democrats have campaigned on the issue. Polling suggests it was the second biggest concern for voters, above crime, above gun policy and immigration. One political scientist told the BBC that abortion rights actually helped the Democrats stave off a red wave. Democrats campaigned on another issue too, American democracy, because the midterms as a whole were in some ways a test of Donald Trump's false claim about the 2020 election being stolen. And the BBC's analysed the performance of candidates for the Senate, House and governorships who've publicly denied that result. 124 of them won their seats, 40 lost. Now, a lot of those wins were in safe Republican seats, but in the more closely contested states, Democrats did well against them, like in Pennsylvania, Michigan and Wisconsin. Voters rejected election-denying candidates for governor. And those Republican losses matter, because many of them were endorsed by Donald Trump, and so these results have the potential to dent his standing. Watching all of this, one Fox News journalist tweeted, GOP source tells me if it wasn't clear before, it should be now. We have a Trump problem. Then this is the front page of the once Trump-friendly New York Post, owned by Rupert Murdoch, saying Trumpy Dumpty had a great fall. Or the Wall Street Journal, also owned by Rupert Murdoch, concluded Trump is the Republican Party's biggest loser. And they may not be saying so, but 
we can be confident both Donald Trump and Ron DeSantis will be noting all of this because midterms always connect back to who's president and who might want to be. To unpack this, Mark Landler, the New York Times bureau chief in London, came in to see us. He's a former White House correspondent during the Obama and the Trump years. Okay, how about oh, one New, York, New York Times? Ah, uh, 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 okay. Thank you, sir. Say thank you, Mr. Trump. <laughs> I think I'll stop short of that. Normally the midterms are about how is the current president doing, but somehow these midterms have also become about how the last president is doing. Yeah, that's right. And that obviously has to do with the unique circumstances we find ourselves in where the ex-president uh, is this constant vocal participant in the political life of the country uh, and still very much has a vice-like grip over the Republican Party. Well, I think if they win, I should get all the credit. And if they lose, I should not be blamed at all. Classic Donald Trump. He knows he's, he's, he's being very, um, that was very characteristic of him. Um, and, you know, he's not completely wrong in the sense that I am sure uh, if the eventual outcome here is very bad for the Republicans, uh, even within the party, other people will find other people to blame. There'll be plenty of other targets but there were explain. some candidates which he really came behind, and surely those are test cases to some degree of, of his ability to, to win elections. Oh, yeah, no question. There are a number of cases across the country where Trump-endorsed candidates uh, didn't win their races, and that for that, he will be, if not blamed, it will be viewed as a reflection of perhaps his weakened state. There, there's still a wide expectation he's going to run. What is interesting in the wake of the midterms, though, uh, is that there, there was a sense of a kind of a different atmosphere, a slightly different outcome than people mm -hmm. expected. And he doesn't go into that announcement with, with the head of steam he might have had the Republicans done better. And perhaps one of the reasons for that is this next man we're going to see. The woke agenda has caused millions of Americans to leave these jurisdictions for greener pastures. <laughs> now, well, this he's, great he's sort of like... America Trump without the crazy. I mean, he's, it's a very populist message. The first time he was elected governor was by quite a narrow margin. Mm -hmm. This time he swept to one of the biggest victories of, of, the, of the whole night. Uh, he emerges from these midterms as a much stronger figure. Uh, and if he chooses to, a really formidable rival to Donald Trump. We have the worst inflation in four decades, the worst collapse in real wages in 40 years. So it was a sad night at Fox. On several grounds, by several benchmarks, it should have been a, a much worse night for the Democrats. That is a searing indictment of the Republican Party. Inflation is a major concern that people have. Gas prices, food prices, all that stuff. President Biden has a 42 percent approval rating, and you wouldn't expect on the face of it for any president at 42 percent to have the second best midterm election outcome in the last 25 or 30 years. And yet, there are other reasons that change the outcome. And they are? Well, most, most notably, I would argue, the Roe versus Wade decision in the Supreme Court last summer, which had the effect of really mobilizing and galvanizing Democratic voters, particularly women. This is a place where fundamental rights are protected and women can make their own decisions about their bodies. Turnout is a, is a critical part of any democratic victory, and this did turn out people. Our democracy has been tested in recent years, but uh, with their votes, uh, the American people have spoken. How do you assess where all of this leaves him? Well, had he uh, really had his um, clock cleaned, had he lost badly, had he been shellacked, to use Obama's phrase, there That's would some be... some good phrases I'm learning yeah, here. There would, be a, there would be an immediate debate about whether it was time for him to stand aside, right. not run for re-election. Instead, what we're hearing is you have a, now an emboldened president. Buddy Joe Biden, congratulations, man. Congratulations. And, and it actually presents the Democrats with a bit of a quandary, because if you think that an 80-year-old Joe Biden is too old to run for re-election, you're now in a more difficult position of, of perhaps preventing that from happening or looking for alternatives um, because he's come out of this in a slightly stronger position. Thanks for coming to see us. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me, Ross. It was really good.